Turn your Bibles to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, and we're going to notice just a small detail in verse 10. I've been stirred up and reminded of many things and encouraged in so many ways uh, by those who have, have led us, but by the presence of each one of you. Uh, this assembly would not be the same if you were not here, regardless of whether uh, you're up front or near the front or the back. And God sees that you are here, and there's somebody else that sees that you are here. You are, are noticed, and you are known, and in some way, uh, maybe beyond what you know, you are an encouragement to someone here. You are, are needed. Uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, as, as I am, uh, happy that you, you could join us. If you have any questions about uh, anything that I say, uh, you, you have the right, uh, even dare say, the responsibility uh, to ask that, and I have the responsibility to, to give an answer for every word that I speak. Uh, you can't trust everything that I say. You can trust everything that you can read, and I hope it is evident that my purpose and my plan and everything that I say is to speak as God has spoken. Uh, that's my purpose in being with you. That's the purpose for which you have helped to share in the work in, in Fairbanks, and I'm blessed to be able to share in the work here for just a, a few days. As Brendan has mentioned, to, to be reunited with him, uh, he, I know, is a blessing to you as he is to, to my family. Um, is, uh, doing the work of an evangelist has challenges at times, but the benefits far outweigh those. And I, I come to better understand in some ways what Paul said to the Philippians and his love for the church there. Of course, he had spent... Uh, uh, some amount of time with them and, and knew them well, uh, but I, I count this week uh, akin to that in some ways to get to know you better, uh, as I mentioned in the lesson before, that the help you share is not a mere transaction of, of numbers, but it's a sharing in, in the work, uh, and so thank you for being willing to, to do that uh, for this time. I'm thankful for the encouragement that you, you are to Brendan. He has shared that with me in different ways and different conversations that, that we've had and so it is a privilege to be with you, but above, above all today, the focus is not on me or him or us, it's on the God whom we serve, who gives us all of these opportunities and every blessing that we have. And so let's keep our hearts centered on him, and then through him uh, we're mindful of all, of all of these things. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10, we have something of a, a unique detail that is given. I'm not sure that any other book in the New Testament, or maybe even the Old, gives this detail. That John tells us the specific day in which he received the revelation. Uh, as I say that, maybe some of the Old Testament prophets did point out that time frame. But at least in the New Testament, I uh, might say that, that that's rare. He says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And so that is when then all of uh, the things that were revealed to him that he recorded and we have for that. I want to hone in on just those three words, though, because when John says, uh, mentions the Lord's Day, he doesn't pause and explain when the Lord's Day is. You know, if this morning I said something about, well, I went to such and such a place on my birthday, well, you, you might pause and think, well, I don't know when your birthday is, so what's the relevance? Why would you mention that without explaining the timing? So notice John doesn't stop and do that. He just mentions this happens on the Lord's Day, and he goes on, he doesn't stop to tell them when the Lord's Day is. And why not? Because obviously they, they knew when it was. They, uh, you, if you knew me well enough, I wouldn't have to tell you when my birthday was. John didn't have to stop and explain when the Lord's Day occurred. They, they all knew that. But if we were reading Revelation for the first time, uh, we, we might not immediately or automatically know when that is. And so that's what I want us to consider this morning. Uh, not just the, the timing of when is the Lord's Day, but why, why is it called the Lord's Day? And what, what does it mean? Uh, what, what is its purpose? The song we sang a moment ago rightfully said, here we bring our offering on this holy day, but only God can make something holy. Uh, only God can make us holy. What is it that makes this day holy? That's what I want us to consider this morning. And, of course, I give away part of the answer in the title, but I want us to, to dig into that and consider it maybe even as though we, we didn't know for sure. How would we work through that? How might we be able to teach someone? Uh, because there is no verse that says 
specifically, the Lord's Day is fill in the blank, so how can we know? And can we know? And how can we be more effective in helping others to understand this holy day, which John, the only New Testament writer, refers to as the Lord's Day? I also want us to notice, because he's always busy doing this, how Satan interferes with what God has done. It would be much more pleasant and much easier to just say, here's what God has done, and so let's follow that and let's do that, and we can leave with a smile. But uh, in, on every occasion that God has a plan, well then Satan, Satan never has a plan, he only has counter plans. God makes the plan, and then Satan just imitates that and counterfeits it in some way. And so we can't be so naive as to think, well let's just... Uh, let's just focus on the things that are said and, and ignore what everybody else does or believes or what might be said or done well, because Satan is behind those other things. And so our focus will be upon our God, but we'll also remember we have an enemy. And so let's consider the Lord's Day today. First of all, how would you answer the question, when is the Lord's Day? Because there is no book, chapter, and verse that explains that in totality and in detail. We, we maybe could compare that phrase to another phrase, the Lord's Supper. And that's only used in one passage in the New Testament. But maybe that gives us a little bit of a clue, right? Well, the Lord's Supper. It's the supper that, that He initiated, that He revealed. He had ideas and plans for that. So maybe that's a little bit of a hint to us in understanding the Lord's Day. You know, it's true. And it's been said to me before, well, but every day is the Lord's Day. Yes, the cattle on a thousand hills, they're, they're all His. That's true. But for some reason, the Holy Spirit revealed these things to John on this day that is identified as the Lord's Day. So there, there must be something there. If we were to say, well, what, what are all the possibilities? What, what might be the Lord's Day? Well, then we would go into a study of, of the Bible and find out, well, what are days that are of some spiritual significance? What, what might quali possibly qualify as the Lord's Day? And so the Bible mentions, even in the New Testament, uh, some different days of spiritual significance. Jesus, uh, He's our standard, so shouldn't we do everything that Jesus did? Well, that, that actually might be a sneaky, tricky question, because Jesus observed Passover, Matthew tells us, in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 17. Jesus also participated in the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles, John chapter 7 and verse 2. I'm not turning to read these passages, just giving you the, a summary of what is there. So Jesus participated in a variety of holy days. But turning your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2, is it possible that the, the Feast of Passover, is it possible that the Feast of Tabernacles, that that's the Lord's Day, that that's when John received these things and he was calling attention to those days. Well, in Colossians chapter 2, Paul is giving a series of warnings and teachings. And in verse 16, he says, Let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths. Think about those three things he mentions. Festivals, new moons, and Sabbaths. Let's work from the bottom up. How often does a Sabbath occur? Well, that's weekly. How often do new moons occur? Well, we still kind of track that, the phases of the moon, and that's, that's a monthly process. Well, so the festivals here would refer to the annual festivals of the Old Testament. Uh, the, the instructions God gave, things like Passover, things like the Feast of Tabernacles. Those were annual festivals. And so what Paul is saying here, let no one judge you about those Jewish weekly festivals, those Jewish monthly days, or about those annual, those once a year holy days. So the Lord's Day must be something of significance, since it is called that. And since Paul writes here, don't let anyone judge you about those days. Now privately, they might participate in, in something, some of those in some ways, but, but as a whole... Uh, that, that those, things are, those days are not for the Lord's churches. And, and so he says, let no one judge you. So I, I think we could easily eliminate those. That the Lord's Day is not the, feast of, the day of Pentecost. 
It's not the Feast of Tabernacles. It's not the Passover. And it's not the Sabbath day. There's some who are, are convinced of that. But Paul says here, let no one judge you regarding Sabbaths, regarding any Sabbath, any kind of Sabbath. Let no one judge you. So we can rule those out. Well, but that tells us when it isn't. But we want to know when it is. And maybe you already know the answer. That's okay. Or if you don't, study with me. As we read though, the, from the men who gave a record of the life of Jesus, think about your own study of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. How often, how many occasions can you think of of some event in the life of Jesus that Matthew and Mark and Luke and John all write about it. If, if we were in a Bible class setting up, might might call for a show of hands. Can, how, how many parables did all of them mention? Now, there's not very many, are there? In fact, Jesus's Jesus's birth, of course, is mentioned by is recorded by Matthew and Luke, but John and Mark give no detail concerning it. So out of all of, but think of the few, the few things that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John do all record of the life of Jesus. Now out of that pool of things, when they do talk about the same thing, do they typically give the same details? Well, no, usually that's, sometimes we'll study, we call it a harmony. We, we put them all together. We study Matthew with Mark, with Luke, with John, so that we can gather and find, oh, this person is mentioned by Matthew, but oh, John tells us that someone else was also there, but Matthew didn't mention him. And of course, that's not a contradiction. It's a harmony. They all fit together. So the resurrection is on that short list of things that is mentioned by Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. And of course, there are some details in which they differ, not in which they contradict. But Matthew tells us some things that Luke might not, and Mark tells us some things that John might not. But what I want you to notice, either by flipping through these passages or, or by memory, there, there is one detail, at least one, that Matthew mentions exactly as Mark mentions, exactly as Luke mentions, and exactly as John mentions. What is that detail? Well, Matthew mentions in connection with the resurrection of Jesus that it was on the first day of the week. And then Mark, in recording the resurrection of Jesus, mentions the first day of the week. And Luke mentions the first day of the week. And John mentions the first day of the week. That might seem small and trivial, but think about how many different ways they could have recorded the timing of Jesus' resurrection. Matthew could have said it occurred on the third day. Because that's, that's how Jesus spoke of His resurrection. He never said, I'm going to rise on the first day of the week. He said, on the third day. In our reading from a brother earlier in 1 Corinthians 15, that's how Paul refers to it. But Matthew calls it the first day of the week. Well, Mark could have told us the day of the month. You know, the Jews, they track their time by months like we do. So he could have identified the day of the month. John could have told us the, the day of the year on the, you know, the, the 134th day of the year or where, whenever they, their calendar was. And then we've had to figure out, well, was he talking Jewish time or Roman time? But he could have done it that way. There's a host of ways, aren't there, to identify the timing in which something occurs. And so it is no accident that Matthew and Mark and Luke and John not only all talk about His resurrection, but they all identify the timing of His resurrection in exactly the same way. If we were to just read one, Matthew or Mark or the others, then the timing, that might not jump out at us. But if we read Matthew for the first time, and then Mark for the first time, and then Luke and then John, then we'll notice a pattern here. There, there are some patterns in Scripture. We'll notice a pattern here. Consistently, the first day of the week is a day of some significance, at, if for no other reason, in that Jesus arose on the first day of the week. But you know, if we were doing our, uh, our Bible reading and we read through the life uh, of Jesus, and we come to the book of Acts, if we never were to read again about the first day of the week, then we might just think, okay, well that, that was just the third day. And so I know when He arose, and so I, I go on learning about the life of Jesus Christ. But it's not the last time, is it? Turn with me to Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. 
Maybe a word, a verse that you've read and discussed and thought about often. But think about the book of Acts with fresh eyes in some ways. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, Luke is someone known for being pretty precise as he writes. If you read Acts chapter 27 and that, that ship journey that, that Paul made, Luke identifies different places and even winds. Uh, and so a lot of detail. Uh, tomorrow night, if the Lord wills, we'll study from Acts chapter 13 about a man named Sergius Paulus. And Luke identifies him as a proconsul. That was a specific term used only by the Romans. So Luke gets a little bit technical sometimes. In Acts chapter 20, verse 7, Luke writes, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. In, in your study of Acts, whatever your knowledge of it is, can you think of any other occasion where Luke identified the day of some event by the day of the week on which it occurred? He, he gives a, a lot of detail. Paul went to Athens and then Corinth and, and Macedonia, sometimes the region, sometimes he mentions the city. He gives a variety of details, but on any other occasion... Does Luke identify, well, Paul arrived in Corinth on the second day of the week, and then Paul arrived left from Corinth on the fifth day of the week. That's just not, even though Luke is given to detail, that's not the way that he, he describes and follows the journeys of Peter or Paul or others. So if we were just reading Acts and had not read Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, we might read right past Acts chapter 20, verse 7, and that the, the detail there might just fall into the background. But, as we've noticed what, how Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John recorded the day of Jesus' resurrection, now, when Luke identifies them coming together on the first day of the week, it's like he's saying, on the day that Jesus arose from the dead, the disciples gathered together. See, this is no just random time marker, he's identifying their gathering with something that Luke had already written about, and that John and Mark and Matthew either had or were going to write about as well. So it, it's subtle, but there's, there's a message there. There's something important there. That also helps us to identify that what happened here was more than, than routine, uh, when it says the disciples came together, well, was that, you know, the disciples could come together on a variety of occasions for a lot of different reasons. But this coming together is associated with the first day of the week, which is associated with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is no casual gathering. Of course, the phrase, the words breaking bread, it can refer to, to any two people, God's people or not, just sitting down and having a meal together. But this, is, this breaking bread is connected to the first day of the week, which is connected to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is no routine meal. Now, can Christians sit down and have a routine meal together? Of course they can. Is that what the Lord's Supper is? No, it is not. And Paul explained that in, in more detail in 1 Corinthians 11. He said, if you need to fill your, fill your belly, then do, at it, do that at home. And Christians did that from house to house. And maybe even they ate together uh, in, on the same occasion they were meeting together, but the church was not overseeing and planning such meals. This was a holy day. This was a holy gathering. This was a holy meal. Well, uh, well taught a few minutes ago by our brother. And then Paul preached to them. Well, was he just giving them an, an update on his third cousin and, and her wedding and how that went and, and what the latest sports uh, event going on at the Colosseum in Rome was? Well, he was speaking to them, but he was speaking a holy message to them. And a part of that is all tied up in this, in this chronological, this time marker, this time stamp that Luke gives. But it's just subtle. On the first day of the week. If we did not have Matthew and Mark and Luke and John recording that, we might read right by, pass right by this. Uh, but now we see all, all of these are, are fitting together. There's something of significance here. And then turn over with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, or maybe 
Uh, Maybe you remember this text. As, As I turn, as you turn, also be thinking with me, In all the writings of Paul, I I don't have them memorized either, but in all that Paul wrote, how many occasions can you think of where he said, here's what I want you to do, and here's when I want you to do it. I want you to do it on this day of the week, or this day of the month, or this day of the year. How many times? I can only think of one. And maybe you can help my study later if I've overlooked one. But here's the only occasion I can think of. He says in verse 1, Here I gave orders to the churches of Macedonia, or the churches of Galatia. And he says, You must do also, verse 2, on the first day of the week. And and the New American Standard here is most precise. On the first day of every week, let each one of you lay something aside. Now, of course, there's a commitment that they had made, but every church has made some commitments. And so every church has, has the need and the responsibility to lay some, for each part to lay something aside on every first day of the week. But what I want you to notice is this is also unusual for Paul. He doesn't usually point out something to be done on a particular day of the week. When he says this, it's like he's saying, on the day that Jesus arose from the dead, I want you to lay something aside. Does, does that add any context to what we do? And this is no accident. Luke and Paul, they, they are of the same mind. They're, they're using exactly the same words, just like Matthew, Mark, and John did as well. So while these passages are separated by context, notice the, the, the uniqueness of of a phrase like this, of a time stamp, in connection with something that should be done. And so if we're thinking, well, when is the Lord's Day? That's that's where we started. What, what What are the candidates? What are the possibilities for the Lord's Day? And what we find is there's only one possibility. We might call that a necessary conclusion or a necessary inference, but whatever you want to call it, it points us only to one possibility. There is only one candidate to vote for, so to speak. The Lord's Day is the first day of the week. If we believe that only Scripture is God-breathed, then this is, as we sang, on this holy day, this is not only a holy day, it is the only holy day. And I hope that's simple. I hope that's fundamental, basic for you. Think about some of the applications then that that come from that. Uh, There's something that that many people call the Christian calendar. Maybe you're familiar with that, maybe you aren't or or not. If there is such a thing as a Christian calendar, who has the authority to to fill in the blanks of the calendar? Who Who has the authority to say, here is what must be on the calendar of every single Christian and of all of the churches that belong to Jesus Christ. Who has, do you have authority to, to write that calendar for the church up in, in Fairbanks? Do I have the authority to, to fill out a calendar for the church here? Well, no, of course not. But there's someone who has all authority in heaven and on earth. The head of his church, the head of all of his people. If there is a Christian calendar, well then the Christ ought to be the one to fill out that calendar. And I guess you could say that he has. What would that calendar look like if it was hanging on your wall? The first day of the week, mark it. The first day of the week, the next week, mark it. If you have another week, mark the first day of the week. And that's what the Christian calendar would look like. But we live in a society, we live in a context where men say, well, yeah, that's, that's important. I can read that in the Bible. But here we also need to be marking Advent. And then we need to be marking Lent and Palm Sunday and Easter. And for many in our society, and maybe if you're visiting, well, Christmas and Easter might be the only two that you're familiar with, but you need to know, number one, that you can't read about Christmas in the Bible. You can't read about Easter. Now, you can for sure read about the birth of Jesus. And you can for sure read about the resurrection of Jesus. We've done that this morning. But in regards to there being an annual holy day, You can't read that in your Bible. 
But if we start going down the path of filling in blanks, for, filling, filling out a Christian calendar, then we've got to ask, well, by what authority is that done? And who's, who, who originated such ideas and practices? And if man can fill in one blank, did you know that there are some who would say there is a holy day for the feast of the circumcision of Jesus? There's a holy day for the beheading of Jesus? There are some who count those as holy days of obligation. What's the problem with that? Well, not just because we sang here we bring our offering on this holy day. The song doesn't prove it. But what we found is if we're going to let the Bible be our guide, we sang a song uh, saying that was our, our plea and our appeal. If we're going to let the Holy Spirit be our guide, well, the Holy Spirit has filled out the calendar. And Jesus arose on the first day of the week. That's the only day that God authorizes on His holy calendar, if we want to call it that. Now, other passages would teach us individually, privately. We might remember certain things on a particular day. That's, that's, that's of a different sort. But I'm talking about a Christian calendar, something for all God's people. Only Christ has the authority to do that, and He has done that. And everything else falls into, we read earlier from Colossians 2, where Paul gave a warning. And later in that chapter, he gave a warning about the doctrines and the commandments of men. And that's where a holy day called Christmas, that's where a holy day called Easter has come from. It's come from the doctrines and the commandments of men. I don't say that arrogantly, and we don't need to be arrogant or boastful about not keeping those days. But what, what we can do is by elevating and emphasizing the importance of the Lord's Day, then helping others to see. And when those seasons come around, we need to be patient, but help others to see. Did, did it ever occur to any of our friends that Mary, the very mother of Jesus, if anyone knew when Jesus was born, I suppose she did. But... Mary never wrote a Christmas card. Christmas in the sense of a holy day. Mary, Peter, Paul, they, they never celebrated Easter Sunday. But there is, if you want to call it Resurrection Sunday, if you want to call it that, I would just rather call it the Lord's Day. The first day of the week marks the day in which Jesus arose from the dead. That helps to answer the second question. Well, why? John called this day the Lord's Day. Well, why? What's, what's the importance of that day? And we've looked already at the passages. So I'm not going to reread them, but just leave them there for, for emphasis. Jesus' resurrection is the first and the main event connected with the first day of the week. It is a weekly memorial of Jesus' resurrection. That's why the first day is the Lord's Day. So could any other day be of more importance than the day that Jesus, that Jesus appointed? Of course not. But another, another way to consider that, could any other day be of equal importance? And again, that's, that's where the influence of Satan exists many times, is that, well, Christmas is made to be of equal importance to the Lord's Day. Now, in the eyes of some people, it's even more important. Easter, likewise, for some people in our culture, well, you know, that, that's one of the two big days. But what that shows is, I don't know what people would say, but I can see what they do. And many times, it's the Christmas and the Easter, and that's given more significance than what in Scripture is called the Lord's Day. What would you think if I said, well, how about one day a year, one Sunday a year, we have a really special Lord's Supper. Uh, we'll use some special trays and, and some, some nicer cups. And we'll spend some more time because we're going to really make this, not about how many minutes, but we're just going to, we're going to make this the important, Lord, the, uh, the annual Lord's Supper. And we'll still do it every other first day of the week. But once a year, we're going to really have a special one. You say, well, well no. Uh, each one is unique and special and important for a whole host of reasons. Well, that, that's how many people would describe what they call Easter Sunday. That, well, yes, every Lord's Day is a reminder of the resurrection, but here's the time, here's the, the annual one. Well, but wait a minute. Let, let's don't make something equally, much less more important, than something that, that God has. And I mention that in part because uh, little by little, 
in a, in a different way. Uh, I see even brethren saying, well, it's good. People are talking about the resurrection of Jesus and the birth of Jesus on these occasions. And so they'll, they, they'll emphasize the Christmas and the Easter aspect of it. Even, even some brethren are doing that. Uh, I'm all for talking about the birth and the resurrection of Jesus any day of the year. I don't know of anyone who says we should be silent about that. But in a, re- a lesson about the resurrection of Jesus is very different than an Easter lesson. And a solid lesson about the birth of Jesus Christ is very different than a Christmas lesson. And I, I believe you know that difference. I hope, I hope you do and you continue to. Jesus' resurrection changed the history of this world. I, I suppose we have peop- some people here interested in history. Maybe even we have some people who in different ways participated in some significant events in the history of this nation or of the world. But Jesus' resurrection goes beyond and exceeds all of that, literally changing the direction of nations, but more importantly, changing the direction of hearts and souls and minds. If anything deserves a memorial, it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And God made one. That memorial is the Lord's Day. So then the last question that might come to mind is, well then, how or what? Uh, What what do we do if it's when it is the Lord's Day? Think of it in in this way. This doesn't prove the point. But what do most people do when there's a group of people who have some particular day that is of significance to all of them. They, they share that in common. Well, usually they, they get together and then they do something, right? So think about a birthday. In our culture, what, what typically do we do? There's a particular day of the year that's of significance to a group of people. How do they do that? Well, they usually get together and then they do something. They, we could say they congregate. <laughs> they gather, and we call it a birthday party. So that, but you don't just gather and then sit together and all remember that someone was born on that day. Well, we do something. Maybe the custom is we bake a cake and stick a couple fire sticks on it and then put the fire out. That, that's how we do it, right? Or something like that. We get together and we do something. Uh, in our society, Independence Day, How do Americans typically do that? Well, in a sense, okay, we all individually maybe remember events on that day, but typically, from community to community, Americans congregate, they gather, but then they don't just sit there in the same place and remember together. They gather and then they do something. And so we have a fascination with fire, I guess. We like some fire on a birthday, and we like fireworks on Independence Day. Uh, My kids like fire. Uh, we, we need a little bit of that uh, where we live. So that, that's just the nature of it. I, I don't know. Maybe that's just coincidence. But whether it's coincidence or not, how do we do the Lord's Day? Well, I think we've covered that, haven't we? In fact, we were reminded earlier in the Old Testament, there were occasions where God did that with them, where God called them, come to Jerusalem at least three times a year gather, congregate, and then do something. And typically in the Old Testament, when they came together, what would they do? They would worship. And that was certainly the appropriate response to different occasions. The Feast of Passover. What would you do in response to the, the Independence Day of the Israelites? Uh, it would be a right response to worship, to come together together, in the presence of God, and worship. And so God God had a habit of that in the Old Testament. God gathered them, and then God planned various activities for them when they came together on that occasion. And so in the New Testament, we see the same thing. God calls His people to meet Him on the first day of the week. Well, but what's the occasion? Why are we coming together? Now, There could be more than one reason we might explain that. But I want you to think about the first reason. It's to remember that Jesus arose from the dead, but not just to gather together and sit in a room and all remember at the same time. Well, what are we going to do? What are we going to do to remember His resurrection? Well, 
we're, we're going to worship. And not every song has to be about the resurrection. That's not my point. But when Luke mentions the first day of the week, he is connecting their worship to Jesus' resurrection. And it's interesting. We eat the Lord's Supper, of course, on the first day of the week. I'm not minimizing that at all. But have you ever considered, we don't eat the Lord's Supper on the day that Jesus died. We eat the Lord's Supper to remember He died. But we don't eat the Lord's Supper. It's not a funeral. We are remembering someone who died. But the context, the occasion is, we are remembering His death. But we're not remembering someone who is still dead. We are remembering the death of someone on the day that that someone arose from the dead. That, that gives a little more context. Should we be sad when we eat the Lord's Supper? We should because He died. We should because we sinned. But we, it's in the context of a day and an occasion where we rejoice because why do we do all these things? Why, why am I talking? Why are you listening? Why are we singing? Because Jesus arose from the dead... Well, we can do that any day, but He arose from the dead on this day. There's a significance to this day. God called it the Lord's Day. So, of course, we always need to be learning. We always need to, rem- be, be, we always need to be remembering Jesus and His death and His resurrection. And there's any occasion where we can, uh, can uh, offer teaching. But think about the uniqueness of the context when we teach And we listen because on the day that Jesus arose from the dead, if He didn't rise, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, my words and our time this week are worthless. And in fact, if Jesus did not rise, even His death does not accomplish what we need from Him. Likewise, think about 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Paul says, do this on the first day of the week. On the first day of every week. In doing so, he is tying, he is connecting, giving with the resurrection of Jesus. Not that we're giving in memory of his resurrection. I don't mean it that way. I just mean when we come together, the resurrection of Jesus ought to be on our mind. What what greater event would prepare us to do what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 9, to be a cheerful giver? And then to close that section, 2 Corinthians 9.15, thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. In that context, Paul had been talking about financial gifts that were being sent from Corinth and from others to share with the burdens of the saints in Jerusalem. But after talking about that financial opportunity, he closes that by saying, thanks be to God for His indescribable gift. And that sets well. We, we can share with one another on a variety of occasions and ways and days. But isn't it a unique occasion in context to give on the day that we remember Jesus arose from the dead? All of that is in the background. The worship that we offer to God because Jesus arose from the dead, is what makes this a day of joy and an assembly of, of joy that I hope never grows old. And, it, and it's true, repetition can become a challenge. It's easy to become complacent when we do the same thing and we know what we're going to do the next day or the next week and the next time we know ahead of time. It's easy for that to, to feel a little bit boring. But who is someone that you love the most on earth who has died if you were to receive a knock on your door one day, that that person is alive again, would that news ever get old to you? If it was your husband, your wife, maybe you lost a child, some, some, someone else, would you ever get tired of being reminded that life was restored and the gift was given back to you? If it began to get boring, you, you would find a reason to renew in your heart thanksgiving for God giving you that gift for at least another day. And so every first day of the week, God called this the Lord's Day. Yes, because it belongs to Him, but also because we need this constant reminder of God's indescribable gift. And so let's keep this day and this assembly a priority. 
Who deserves our attention on the Lord's day? The Lord deserves our attention. And so our schedules need to work around that. Consider this when we make travel plans. Consider when it is the Lord's day. Uh, When you're making career decisions, consider the Lord's day. When our children are participating in teams and clubs, consider the Lord's day. Let that be a priority. And yet, of course, with all of our planning, there may be times where we cannot meet with God's people. But don't forget, again, Paul set the stage in several ways. When we worship God, we're not only meeting with each other, we're first meeting with God. And so there may be some occasion where it's not possible for me to meet with God's people on the Lord's day. On such occasions, be sure that you remember the Lord and worship Him on the Lord's day. Yes, every day is from God, but God chose this one day for His church and for His churches and for His saints. Learn God's plan for the Lord's day and and practice that faith as you have today. God accomplishes in this day more than than we can realize, but I hope that our time together this morning accomplishes something that we can realize that will encourage us, help us, and prepare us to serve Him on His day. Turn in your songbooks uh, to to number 268 or turn your attention uh, to the song, Hark the Gentle Voice of Jesus. Do you believe that Jesus died and arose from the dead? Uh, On whatever day you recognize that, you uh, hope that you will call out for His help and seek His help. If you know that He arose from the dead and you know that your sins are the reason that He died, would you confess that faith? If you today are ready to do that, if you're ready to be baptized into Christ, baptized into His death, then you'll also be raised, raised with new life and to walk in newness of life. And we're singing this song in part to remind you of what Jesus offers to you. If you're here and you are a Christian, have you turned back uh, to your your old ways? I hope that thinking about what Jesus has given to you, all that we have have said today, will remind you of your need for His help and if you need to turn back to Him, and our prayers will again stir you up to love and good works. That's, That's why we're here. And if by the grace of God you are today who you ought to be, Uh, We don't boast in that. The song will also remind us uh, to serve Him for today. We don't know about tomorrow. Uh, Let's sing this song with the hope and the joy that God gives to us. And if we can help you, if we can serve you in any way, come down, tell us how we can as we stand, as we sing.